Welcome to the Reverend Guitar Circle R Ranch. Today, it's the Bass Ranch. Look at this. We are so excited to Yay. have Mr. Andy Irvine here with us. Hi. And we are going to play a little game of Meet Andy with the Reverend 12 Questions. Are you ready, Andy? I'm ready, sir. Well, then, Let's do th it. this first one's really simple. Okay. Give us a brief history of your playing career. Okay. I started playing in 1982. I didn't select the bass. I was selected to be the bass player of the neighborhood band. I was appointed to be the bass player. And uh, that's how I got a bass for my 12th birthday. And I was immediately already in the band that day. And from then on, I just started, we started rocking out and started jamming and doing Wild Thing and um, Sunshine of Your Love and things like that. And we were called Grey Haven. From there, uh, I was in, the, throughout the 80s, I was into like uh, New Wave of British Heavy Metal, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and things like that were my, um, my life's blood. I lived off of, of, of metal as, as a young teen. And then uh, I went to, in my college years, I started getting into funk and soul and R&B and doing blues gigs and things like that. And that transitioned me into more of a kind of an appreciation for funky soul music, American roots music, and um, that kind of a thing. And then, you know, I just went on and played gigs and toured around and was in van bands that were trying to get signed and doing showcases at all the famous clubs all over the country and all that kind of stuff. And uh, eventually, around the time when YouTube first started, a friend of mine from back home from my, from my first band I was ever in said, hey, you should make videos. You can put them on this thing called YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then people from all over the world can uh, see you playing. And you can, you know build a career that way or whatever. He's the one who suggested it to me and I started doing that. That was around, I think around 2005 or 2003. Okay. I started doing that. And one thing led to another and I ended up getting into the industry side of, of doing bass demos and working for bass companies and going to bass trade shows and building basses and working with accessory companies and being a design yeah. consultant and being a prototype tester and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at now. Of course, I still play in bands. I play 150 shows a year. And uh, I do lots of bass videos and stuff. And I've published about 4,000 bass videos. Our second... Jesus, 4,000. Wow. <laughs> uh, our our second ridiculous. question is, is what inspired you to pick it up to begin with. But what inspired you to pick it up to begin with was that you were needed. I was needed. I was appointed to be the bass player. And, you know, they said, it's easy enough that you can handle it, Irvine. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> Had you ever thought about playing before that band developed? I mean, no. was it something that was really even on your radar? No, they no just but I loved right music you. before that. Yeah, right. Because I worked with the next door neighbor was a DJ and I was kind of running, he had this like makeshift lighting rig and he had a, D, a DJ system and he did, we did, he did wedding parties and okay. stuff. Okay. And I was going and I would run the lights and it was like, you know, you know, funky town and I believe in miracles and all this stuff from like 78 sure. to 82, you know, era stuff. And, um, so I loved music. What was your first electric bass? My first electric bass was a Fen uh, P bass uh, copy by oh. Uh, Hondo. Oh yeah, the Hondo. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a Hondo guitar. It was like in the a 80s. 70, late seventies Hondo. Yeah, P bass copy. Yeah, I had a Hondo guitar and a Magnum guitar. Yeah. I don't remember Magnum. Yeah. All right, so you can't. So now this is just randomly inserted here, okay? So you can't think about this. You have okay. to just answer. You ready? Yes. What are your top five favorite records? Go. My top five favorite records are Truth and Soul by Fishbone, Asia by Steely Dan, um, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, um, Physical Graffiti by Led Zeppelin, and whatever the album that uh, uh, Aretha Franklin that has uh, Rocksteady on it. Very Can't nice. Can't remember the name of that album. <laughs> Very nice. Good. Great. Those are great answers. Okay, back that. Yes. Um, so what's the proudest moment of your playing career so far, other than being here with me? The proudest moment? <laughs> um, well, I guess probably playing on the uh, uh, 
doing an album with Tiny Tim, the legendary Tiny Tim. Wow, no shit, that's cool. Yeah, that's probably the proudest yeah. thing I ever did because yeah. he's a very cool um, and esoteric and weird and, and, and incredibly uh, smart guy. And wow. um, neat. It was, I didn't know you did that. Yeah, I did a chamber orchestra uh, album with him in, in about 1992. Cool. That's probably the proudest thing. Nice. Because he's you know, pretty famous and everything. Yeah, oh yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we talked about this a little bit last night. Uh, so how did you first hear about Reverend? Let's see if uh, we have Penny is watching everybody. By the way, we're going to see if she remembers My friend T.J. Armstrong from Nashville, I think, I, well, I had heard of Reverend already because I had seen you. I'd been going to the NAMM show. I went to the NAMM show for like 13 consecutive years, and I had walked by your booth. And, 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 I, and I, was, I was hip to Reverend back in the Rumblefish days, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. long, long ago. Mm -hmm. So I knew, as a bass player, of course, I knew what it was. But then I started seeing you guys at the trade shows. And, but it was my friend T.J. Armstrong in Nashville that said, you ought to go meet uh, Ken and Penny. And nice. he uh, facilitated our first meeting. And, you know, the story from there is, is that I'm a, I'm a huge uh, lover and uh, believer in when, a, when, a, when anybody can kind of hit the trifecta that I call it a value, performance, and quality per price point and make an instrument that kicks ass at a good price that's durable and lasts and plays. And I love that. Yeah. That I'm in the business of loving that, and I'm in the business of finding that and telling people about it. And you guys do that, you know. Awesome. Thank you. Incredibly well. Um, what Reverend bases are you using? Don't I, worry, we have time. Okay, I have four. <laughs> uh, I, I'd love to tell you all about them. Fire I have away. a Sentinel, which is a short scale set neck with a with the with the single P rail pickup in it and a three position mm -hmm. like tele switch on it with uh, three different voicings and then I have um, Thunder Gun which is a set neck uh, two pickup with the split brick and the um, and the um, thick brick pickups in it and it's got the raised uh, centerpiece going down it mm -hmm. and uh, cool block inlays on it and and, and a bound uh, fingerboard and then I have the Decision P in Mulberry Mist with, uh, um, with the really, really cool um, Perloid pickguard on it. And that one I use probably most or second most of, of, of the four. And then I have a Dub King, also in Mulberry Mist. Nice. And that one I use a lot, which is a 30 scale. We'll talk about I'm sure we'll get into yeah. talking about it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the next question is what do you like about it? And which is, we've gone into, you know, this a little bit, but fire away. I mean, what is, is there something that connects all There's of them? There's a whole them? bunch of things. Yeah. Let's, might as well get started because it's going to take a while. The, th the first thing that I like about them is they're different. Yeah. And I like to be different. I like, sometimes I like to be the same, but sure. sometimes I like to be different. And that's what you guys do. That's one of the most appealing things is that you're doing your own thing to a guy like me. You know, it's it's not like the normal stuff. You know what I mean? It yeah, doesn't yeah. look like it, and uh, and and you you have your own proprietary pickups, and all of your el design elements are very much kind of top to bottom, front to back, done in house. You're not kind of like a components brand where you have a basic idea and then you put a bunch of other people's components on it. Sure, it's your own thing. So I, that's one of the primary things is that it's different. Uh, the, the second probably most important thing is that it suits and fits and falls into a specific need that I have for performing, for using it for, for gigging. Like the Dub King, for example, has a really, really great kind of uh, rootsy, kind of a, a rootsy American music, soulful, uh, bluesy tone and vibe. You know, it looks the part, it sounds the part, and it feels the part, and it uh, it sounds great in the in the fabric of the music that I play, which is blues and R&B and jam band and stuff and funky stuff and a little bit country, a little bit of bluegrass, etc. And uh, well, oh, the question is, what do I like about them? Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess you know. <laughs> The, those are probably the primary things. I like the way they look, sound, and play, and the way that they're built, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I like that they're different. Uh, and I know that, that this is an all-encompassing question for you because you use a lot of different gear in a variety of different situations, but what are the main, like, pedals that you use, if you use any, or what are the main amps that you use? Okay. Uh, my sound pretty much has always been kind of 
I'm not a real signal path kind of yeah. junky person. Mostly, mostly what I do is with my hands. I'm able to get a lot of different sound, a lot of different sounds from the instrument, mm -hmm. extract a lot of different sounds by the amount of energy that I put on the instrument. So it's right hand technique is kind of like my pedal board. That's awesome. Um, That's a cool way of looking at it. But that. I do, uh, in one of the bands that I play in, uh, my own band called Puddle Stump, I've been playing exclusively with the pick, and uh, I use an octave pedal that's um, made by Red Witch. Well, yeah, okay, I'm familiar. It's called the Factotum. Cool. Yep. It's an octave and fuzz combined, two-stage pedal, uh, true bypass analog, and I leave the octave on all the time, only a little bit of it, you know, it's very subtle, and I play with the pick, and I play only four string basses in that band, and I sling it really low, <laughs> and I just rock out with the pick, with the, and I have the fattest, coolest sound, and it's all like... Uh, that band I play with a pick the whole time, four string with an octave pedal. And also in that little pedal situation, I have a, uh, a one control uh, chorus pedal, sure, sure. also set very, very subtle. And I have a one control um, reverb that also is set very subtle. So when you turn them on, I mean, I hear them, you know what yeah, I mean? Right, but they're right, not right. like over the top. They're just a little bit of, of uh, secret secret sauce, funky grease that I yeah. step on every once in a while. Because we do covers by Pink Floyd and we do covers by like different different famous rock bands and stuff like that. And sometimes having a little bit of of a specific effect makes it sound more like the original recording a, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, amp wise? Amp wise, I work with th uh, three primary brands, Bergantino, Gensler and GR Bass from Italy. Okay. Those are kind of the ones that I use the most. And um, because I think they, they, in my opinion, they make the best lightweight stuff out these days, you know, transitioning over from big, powerful, heavy duty transformer, ironclad amplifiers with ceramic speakers and everything, which is what I love. I mean, I would use it for the rest of my life if my body could withstand <laughs> that. But we don't live in that time anymore. So as the advent of, of lightweight, modern uh, amp bass amplification started coming in, those were the brands that I gravitated towards because I thought they perform and sound and give me something that's most similar to my big Mesa Boogie stacks and my big Ampeg stuff and my big SWR stuff, etc. Nice. Which I still have all of that too. I have an absurd, absurd amount of amplifiers and cabinets, like 30. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> I know you have an absurd amount of bases too. I do, I do. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. build them too. You know, I'm putting yeah. them together yeah. like Legos. You know, like <laughs> like um, parts bases and stuff. As we come to the end here, yes, sir. Uh, and and I know what I want the answer to this question to be. Uh -huh. but we're going to see what you say anyway. All right. Do you have any unusual hobbies or skills or anything that outside of this industry that you would like to share with us? I'm a mule man. That's where I was hoping. I this own was and go. ride <laughs> and train and study equine. Uh, you know, equine stuff specific to mules, which is, which is, uh, it, it comes from having a horse mother and a donkey father. It's a horse with giant ears, and they're very, very yeah. powerful, and they're really good in the mountains, and they're and you live incredibly in the intelligent. Yes, I live at, my house sits at about 9,000 feet in the high Rocky Mountains on the western slope of the Continental Divide in Colorado. And your mules' names are? Dixie and Emerson. Dixie and Emerson. Dixie's a white one. She's 15. One, fi they're measured in hands. So that's about four inches. So Dixie's about this big, and Emerson's about this big at the shoulder. If you want to see the mules, check out your social media. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. you're watching, I this, take you lessons know. from a guy. I take yeah. lessons from a guy that's uh, been doing it for 60 years. He's kind oh. of like a mule whisperer guy, and I'm cool. lucky that he's my mentor in that. And yeah. I've learned a lot. They they they've taught me a lot about patience and understanding and um, 
being in the moment. We were talking about that because you do some martial arts. Yeah. And it takes you away from everything else because you only think about that right. when you're doing that. Yeah. And that's the same thing. That's what the equine stuff does for me. I don't think about basis. I don't think about gigs. I don't think about anything except for doing what I need to do to yeah, yeah, yeah. stay alive, you know, because, <laughs> you know, yeah, stuff can happen. For sure. <laughs> um, do you have any quick advice for up-and-coming up players? I what? would say probably the most thing that I could uh, uh, encourage up-and-coming players to, to try to do is to evolve into a, a tolerant kind of um, personality to where you let stuff kind of roll off and don't get all upset about um, inconveniences because the nature of this business is going to be very inconvenient a lot of the time. And if, if, you, if, if you're the type of person that makes a big deal about stuff like that and and essentially um, m make yourself difficult in some way or another, it's going to uh, exponentially reduce your opportunity because no one will want to hang around with you. That's a fantastic piece of advice. Truly. Yeah, so yeah. like the cats that can just kind of hang out and just kind of like, oh, we're, the um, lobby call is nine. No, lobby call is 10 now. Or, you know, sound check is four. Well, sound check is going to be 530 now because the headliner needs more time. Or... The show in Cleveland is happening. The show in Cleveland is not happening. You know, there's just, there's, there's like 10,000 in one different situations that are going to arise. And if you can be the one who's just like, okay, if that's fine. I, I'll make it work. Then you're going to do well. Yeah. Because you're not going to be all upset and, and miserable all the time and frustrated. Sure. I had to learn that the hard way because I'm not that, I had to learn how to be that guy. You know what I mean? I'm still learning. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's, a lifelong, it's a lifelong evolution. Of course, yeah. yeah. That's what I would recommend. And practice, you know, course, practice, practice your acts, you know. Yeah, practice for sure. What's next for you? Before we let you go, what's next? What's next in my music yeah, stuff? Yeah. Uh, well, this week I'm going to go visit my mother in, um, in New York and, and my brother and my sister. Yeah. And then when I get back, I have a gig, you know, it's Halloween, and um, we've got this big annual Halloween uh, masquerade bash ball thing that we do. And uh, this, I live up in a ski town, so throughout the ski season, we do some gigs up there. Like uh, we do a regular on Monday and then every other Thursday, and it's just like, it's a party town, you know, it's a ski yeah. town. So people are all jo jovial and ready to party and go skiing and everything, and we just provide the rock and roll nice. atmosphere for going out at night, uh, you know. See you at the NAMM show? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I hope so. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Irvine, Reverend Bass Specialist <laughs> and very, very good friend of the company.